Hello out there and welcome to episode 149 of the Nursing Home Abuse Podcast. When is a Georgia nursing home required to call you? The Nursing Home Abuse Podcast is dedicated to providing news and information for families whose loved ones have been injured in a nursing home. Here are your hosts, Georgia attorneys Rob Schink and Will Smith. Hello out there. Welcome back. My name is Rob Schink. I am an attorney and your singular host for this episode of the Nursing Home Abuse Podcast. This is going to be an episode where I try to address a common question that we get uh, to our office. Sometimes we'll get calls from potential clients and um, they want to report um, a particular type of neglect. So for example, um, when I arrived at the nursing home, um, they told me that my mom had fallen. Um, I was visiting my grandfather in the nursing home and they did not tell me that they changed his medication. Things along those lines where um, the client is not only angry about whatever the action was, but almost as importantly, the person that's calling our office and talking to us is upset that they weren't alerted, that they weren't called and notified by the nursing home that something significant had occurred with their loved one. So as any longtime listener of the show knows, nursing homes in Georgia, pretty much nursing homes across the country, but we're talking about nursing homes here in Georgia. Nursing homes in Georgia that receive Medicare and Medicaid dollars from the federal government, which is to say most of them. Most nursing homes in the state of Georgia that receive Medicare or Medicaid funding, because they do so, are required to follow certain rules that are, we call promulgated, that are set forth by CMS and the federal government, regulations that apply to all nursing homes that are receiving Medicare, Medicaid dollars. Um, and for those law nerds, maybe there's maybe some law students or maybe some lawyers out there that listen to this show. Um, that is found in 42 CFR 483 at all. Search in that area and you're going to find the regulations. But at some point in the distant past, um, the code of federal regulations that govern nursing homes that take Medicare and Medicaid dollars decided that, you know what, there are going to be some particular instances in which the family or the designated representative of the nursing home resident should be alerted to something that has happened in the treatment or care or life of that particular resident. And so those regulations do address in certain instances when that should, in fact, occur. Now, just as a disclaimer, everybody out there understand that on top of federal regulations that require certain things, there are also statewide regulations. So Georgia has its own code. In today's episode, we're going to be talking about what appears in the federal code not in any type of um, the state statutes that address nursing home regulations. And on top of that, there are going to be instances that maybe we don't address today where the nursing home should have called but didn't. And in other words, this is not going to be an extensive, exhaustive list. It's just to give you an idea of the responsibilities of the nursing home with regard to contacting you if your loved one has undergone something at the nursing home. So it's not exhaustive and we're culling only from federal regulations, not state regulations and not any type of common law at this point. So first of all, let me just say this, that the federal code allows a nursing home resident to nominate somebody to actually receive the call or to make decisions on behalf of the resident. Um, it's a, basically a resident representative. 
most of the time that is, you know, the spouse, son, daughter, granddaughter, grandson. And a lot of times, not every time, but a lot of times that individual will have some type of power of attorney, health care directive, something along those lines, and sometimes not. But that's what the code anticipates, is that there will be one individual person when the resident gets signed in that, hey, from now on, if something happens to Mrs. Johnson, we're calling this individual first, or we, the only one individual is listed. So the code anticipates that and allows the resident to have a resident representative that actually gets called. Sometimes we have clients that are actually um, don't have any type of cognitive issues, cognitive impairments that would, you know, require that they need a representative. Um, sometimes those that, that don't have any type of cognitive impairments still want a, a resident representative. Um, but at any rate, one of the first one of the first instances in which the resident representative should be contacted and should be involved is literally at the very beginning, which um, with the care plan. So um, the code sets out that the re the resident representative has the right to participate in the planning process, to be informed of the total health status, and participate in the establishing the goals set forth in the care plan. And we've had episodes in the past that deal with care plans, what goes in them, and then care plan meetings. And essentially the care plan is the, um, after an assessment is done on the resident, meaning from a head to toe, from cog uh, um, cognitive issues to skin integrity to what activities of daily living the resident needs, once that is assessed in terms of what their needs are, then a plan of attack is created. And so the code requires that you, the requires that the resident representative be contacted and informed about the care plan, and they can actually participate. Now, the re resident representative doesn't have to participate; they can decline. But according to the code, they need to be informed of that care plan. What? Hey, the the DON. Um, the RN, the, 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 the doctor, we're all getting together to uh, read the assessment and go over what's actually going to be placed into the care plan. Do you want to, you know, do you want to be a part of that? That should be a conversation that is had by the nursing home. Another, um, another important instance in which the nursing home should give the resident representative a call um, is when that care plan needs to be changed. So again, for the for the law nerds, that's at 42 CFR 483.10 under C, subheading C. The, re the resident representative has the right to be informed in advance of changes to the plan of care, including any type of risks and benefits associated with the change. So for example, Sometimes, and, and we see a lot of this with regard to medication, sometimes the doctor will be attempting to treat um, maybe a issue with the resident, depression, something like that, and it causes uh, another problem. Maybe um, we see a lot of times the resident, when they're medicated, gets zonked out, and essentially they're restrained because the medication is knocking them out. So we don't want that. We want the resident living his or her best life. So they, 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 the, when, the, when the doctor or the RN or whoever it is at the nursing home is saying something along the lines of, hey, we need to make a change with the medication, the doctor prescribes something different, the, the, right, the resident representative has the right to know when that happens and why it happens. So that way when you go and visit your loved one in the nursing home, um, you, you kind of have an understanding of what's going on. That's, that's kind of the, one of the major, major points of all this. One of the, um, one of the other aspects of the care plan and being informed about what's going on is um, the, re the resident 
representative has the right to be informed in advance of the care to be furnished and the type of caregiver or professional that will furnish the care. So in other words, if there is um, a change in the primary care physician that visits the facility um, on that periodic basis, if that's a completely different person, or um, is the resident going to get occupational therapy, physical therapy, what type of a rehab are they getting? Is it going to be for their, you know, generalized weakness of the legs, that kind of thing? Whoever is providing that care, if there's a change in that caregiver, then the resident's representative has the right to come in there and put in their two cents. Like, nope, I don't want anybody from this particular wound care facility, or I prefer that the primary care physician be a woman. Th these type of things, the resident representative has a right to weigh in on any type of changes to the actual care that's um, being provided. Something that doesn't happen too often is the nursing home is required to call the resident representative when the physician that has already been providing care is unable to meet their care requirements. So whether there is some type of issue with the, the, the physician losing their license, or maybe it's something that is above that physician's pay grade. But kind of along the lines of change of physician, the code requires the nursing home contact you or the re re resident representative if the physician is unable to meet care requirements. Um, another, another component is roommate change, like changes with the roommates. So written notice must be provided before a room or roommate change, and you must be provided with the reason for the change. So sometimes this might just be a space issue. Sometimes it might be a behavioral issue. So for example, it might be that one resident is triggering another resident to wander. So, or triggering another resident to, to react in a, um, not necessarily an aggressive way, but it, causing unwanted uh, physical incidents. So in order to minimize that from happening, the nursing home will move one resident to another room. But again, like I said, it might be a space issue. But at any rate, regardless of whatever the reason is, this is an instance under the Code of Federal Regulations that the nursing home is required to call you. You, you, know, you shouldn't be surprised when you walk in one day and your grandmother is in a completely different wing of the nursing facility. Um, moving on, another instance is uh, dealing with Medicaid. Um, generally, um, when the resident's account is $200 or less than the um, Social Security insurance resource limit, they have to call you. So in other words, they're running out of money. That's a time when they need to call you. Different type of charges, like upcharges, they got to let you know. Um, whenever a requested item will result in an extra charge for the resident. So this might be um, uh, different personal items um, that the, the resident might want in their room. Um, if, there, if, if there is going to be some type of charge above and beyond what has already been told to you, you're, they have to let you know about that. Um, one of the more important reasons, one of the more important things that you have to be notified about is what is called an accident under the code. This is at 42 CFR 483.10G you are to be notified as the resident's representative if, quote, an accident that results in injury and has the potential for requiring physical intervention. So this is many different things. It could be if the resident falls, if the resident uh, wanders, if the resident... Um, is in an altercation with another individual. Any time that there is a, an injury, a bodily injury, to that resident that could potentially result in the person's care 
being changed, then that's when they need to, to give you a ring. It's very important. If, if you go to that nursing home and you see your loved one has a bruise on her head and, and, and scratches on her knees and maybe a scrape, um, you know, on the back of her head it, and she has fallen, they should have called you about that. They should have called you about that. These are instances that allow you to be involved because when, if particularly when you're dealing with falls, you need to be notified because care plans might need to be updated based on the fall. So, for example, we've noticed that she is falling. Uh, she fell at 11 p.m. yesterday. She fell at 11 p.m. T- th- this evening. Perhaps this has to do with the fact that this is when she needs to go to the bathroom, and so she gets up and attempts to go to the bathroom and falls. So, therefore, the care plan needs to indicate this, and an intervention may need to be that we make sure that she uh, goes to the bathroom at 1030 and we avoid that issue. But that's one of the most important reasons why you should be involved in this if there has been an injury and if that injury is some type of systematic thing that would require a change in the care plan. You need to be involved in that as, as the loved one of that resident. And again, this is something that's important enough that the Federal Code of Regulations requires it, that they give you a ring, they give you a call. Um, along those same lines, it nece- this doesn't necessarily need to, uh, an injury doesn't need, necessarily need to precipitate this, but um, whenever there's been a significant change, so a significant change in the resident's physical, mental, or psycho- psychosocial status, they have to give you a call. This can be things like um, when someone that is usually active is no longer active. They sit in their, they sit in the, the lounge chair in the lobby and just stare. It can be an instance in which um, someone has uh, just due to generalized weakness in the legs, they go from being able to walk with a walker or rollator and can now no longer do that. They have to be in a wheelchair. That's a significant change. Um, where there is a difference from one day to the next or one week to the next in the overall health of that resident. And again, that can be not just the physical. In other words, well, she, the, she, my grandmother was in a wheelchair. Now she's, you know, she can't even do that. She's in the bed. Or my mother was walking and now she's in a wheelchair. Or my mother was able to communicate. Now she is silent. These are significant changes in the physical or the the mental status, social status of these residents. Whenever that has happened, whenever that nursing home staff observes this, they are required to call you. Again, under the idea that you should be involved in what happens next, what's going to happen in the care plan and what interventions are we going to incorporate into that care plan to address the change. Because again, often, I mean, most of the time, these changes aren't for the better. These are changes in which, you know, that the health is deteriorating. Um, so you want to be involved in how this individual lives their life from day to day from that point forward. You need to be involved in that care plan, and you can't be involved in that care plan if they don't call you. Um, an, another one in, 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 along those same lines is when treatment must be altered. So again, for the law nerd, we're still at 42 CFR 48310 or .10 G. The resident representative needs to be contacted if, quote, a need to alter treatment significantly, that is, a need to discontinue or change an existing form of treatment due to adverse consequences. Um, altering treatment. So again, for the law nerds, we're at 42 CFR 483.10 G. A need to, a resident representative needs to be um, contacted where a need to alter treatment significantly, significantly, that is a need to discontinue or change an existing form of treatment due to um, adverse consequences of a new form of treatment. 
So, in other words, if the individual is no longer responding to um, a particular type of, of rehab or a particular type of medication or a generalized treatment care plan, they need to change that up. They got to let you know. Pretty important. And we addressed this in episode, what episode did we address this in? This was in episode 140. Episode 140, we had William um, Rivera on to talk about um, the hundred Medicare 100-day rule and uh, improper discharges and improper evictions from nursing homes. Um, so if you haven't listened to that, go back and listen to that one. It's a great episode. But the nursing home uh, is required to call you when there has been a decision made to transfer the resident or discharge the resident. In other words, the nursing home is not allowed to just give up and say, this, we're, we're, we're rolling this person's bed out of here, out of the, out of the facility, we're going to get them out of here. They have to let you know um, prior to making that decision and why the decision was made. Um, and another thing is this. They're um, both in the federal code and in the Georgia code. There's something called the Residence Bill of Rights, and that has to mostly do with the fact that a resident doesn't give up their dignity and their rights simply for the fact that they have been admitted to a nursing home. So these are very important rights, and we've, we've addressed this in, in other episodes. Um, I suggest, um, or I would recommend that you go and check those out. But whenever there has been a change in the resident's rights, you have to be notified. Um, which I don't know, like I'd have to go back and really and really look at the legislation, but I don't think there's been a, a, a major changes to, to the actual wording of the resident's rights in a while, either in Georgia or in, or, um, in, the, in the federal code. Um, and lastly, um, whenever um, whenever the nursing home goes through uh, once a year, usually in the fall or winter time, um, uh, with regard to inv- influenza and disease immun- immunization, um, you get an opportunity as the residence representative to refuse immunization if you want from uh, the flu. Um, so that's that's another option. And so we're going to stop on that one. That's the lucky 13. Those are 13 instances in which the nursing home is required to call you under the federal code. But again, like I said, guys, this is a disclaimer is that there are other times they might need to call you for other reasons. I don't want you to think, I don't want you to go away from this episode thinking that these are the only times that they got to call you. But these are pretty important things that they need to call you for, and this encapsulates a lot of them. But again, I, I would again I would draw your attention to the fact that whenever there has been any type of injury that has the potential for changing that care plan for physical interventions that need to come in, um, that's an important thing. So, whenever there is a bed sore that is now requiring treatment, whenever there has been a fall, these type of things that require, you know, that they go to the hospital or anything like that. They are required to let you know, and they got to do that. And they will be in violation of these regulations if they do not. Um, as this episode goes to air, it is June 8th of 2020. Um, I will remind you that June 18th through June 24th is National Nursing Assistance Week, which is interesting. I should have said that Will is not in the south of France. I should have, or actually, I should have said that Will's in the south of France, but it's because he is celebrating National Nurse Assistance Week because Will was a CNA for several years before becoming an attorney. Um, so he's celebrating National Nurse Assistance Week. That's why he's not here. I'm gonna probably, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stick to that is the reason why I'm doing this episode by myself. But um, go out there, hug a CNA. Hug a nurse assistant. Um, they do. They're on the front lines every day, taking care of people, and we really appreciate them for that. Um, and with that, that's going to complete this episode. You are more than welcome to go back to the library, the expanding catalog of the Nursing Home Abuse Podcast. Like I said, this is episode one forty nine, one forty nine. Wow, one forty nine. 
Um, we have 148 other episodes for you to check out. We would love for you to do so. Leave us a comment if you if you like what you hear. Um, but new episodes are every other week on Monday mornings. Uh, so the next episode will be in a couple weeks. Expect it. It'll be episode 150. It'll be a big one. Hopefully we will be here. Um, that'll be good times. But at any rate, that's going to conclude this particular episode of the Nursing Abuse Podcast. Um, and we appreciate you sticking around this far. And we will see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to the Nursing Home Abuse Podcast. Nothing said on this podcast, either by the host or the guest, should be construed as legal advice, nor is intended to create an attorney-client relationship between the host or their guest and the listener. New episodes are available every Monday on Spotify, iTunes, Stitcher, or on your favorite podcast app, as well as on YouTube and our website, nursinghomeabusepodcast.com. Again, that's nursinghomeabusepodcast.com. See you next time.